The following has been recorded at Cairn University. Any reproduction of this recording without the express permission of the university is prohibited. Uh, thank you, Bob. I, I thought he was going to say, here's Todd, and that would be it. But uh, do appreciate the opportunity to share this morning with you, the graduating class of 2018, some thoughts. I want to thank the Board of Trustees, faculty and staff, for a wonderful 10 years. It's a privilege to serve in this capacity at my alma mater, and it has been a joy every day for Dawn and I to be a part of what the Lord is doing here. <clears throat> and it's a privilege to speak this morning, a privilege to speak this morning. And if that's, you know, if the 10-year anniversary becomes an excuse to be here at commencement and to share with you as graduates, then I'm happy to do it because this is the favorite part of my job, to talk to you as students. So this morning, in addition to greeting our guests and the board members, faculty, and staff, I want to greet you, the students, the graduates of Cairn University, May 2018. Your day of celebration, a day when we celebrate God's grace to you and to us and all that has been accomplished in and through your time here at Cairn. The Lord brought you to us here at Cairn. And now, whether you are a graduate or an undergraduate, we recognize that the Lord brought you here from many places. There are students here from all over the world. There are students here of every race. There are students graduating today of various financial situations from different kinds of families with different kinds of abilities and different levels of abilities. You have different interests and different goals. You have different conditions. Some of you anticipating work and job and career. Some of you in the middle of things. Some of you looking for transition. You come from different states of mind and different points in your faith journey. There are many here from different perspectives, but we are one, bound together in and through Jesus Christ, bound together with a love for his word and a commitment to this mission. You have signed on to study with an institution that places at the center the things that are of eternal value, and we have walked a different path together. We drew that tagline from Ephesians 4, where the Apostle Paul, under the inspiration of the Spirit, exhorts Christians to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which they've been called. Not only do you come to Cairn University representing many places and many different positions and conditions, but you come together and now will go out to serve in different capacities. There are many, many callings represented in this graduating class, and yet despite those many callings vocationally, we share in one co common, one calling, to love and to follow and to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. So as you depart today, as you commence and begin what is next for you in your various callings, I want to focus on the most important aspect, our calling as Christians, what we need to do to follow and serve Christ in this world. We've done our level best to make you ready for it at every level. Whether you're an undergrad, a graduate student, whether you studied on campus or studied online, we have given our all to make sure that we impart to you whatever wisdom the Lord has given us to develop in you the skills necessary for success and to give you the kind of experiences that would shape your character and strengthen your faith. And now you go, and it will require much of you, make no mistake about it, to now live out the mission that has shaped your education, you have to do quite a bit. There's much work to be done in this world. You have decisions to make. We talk with the prospective families when they come and visit the university about the important choices that you make. And some of you, as you're graduating, you're adults, you're in the middle of your careers, you have your own families, you've been making your own choices. As undergraduates, you will now venture into a new level of independence and make choices for yourself in ways that your professors will no longer be doing for you about how you'll spend your time or your weekends, the assignments that weigh over you. Other things now, your level of autonomy and independence and the dependence of others on you will be significant. You have choices to make. We learn as parents to let our children go, to make their own decisions and trust that what we've imparted to them, they will carry with them in their choices. I have jokingly told my children for years that they're free to make many, many choices. I will pick the college career and spouse after that, they're on their own. <laughs> well, just kidding. But making choices is part of life and we're very proud of you as graduates and eager to see what God will do in your lives beyond the walls of this institution. But I wanna share a few final reflections because we're sending you into a world that is indeed 
hurting, and in need. It is also a world that is confused. But in the midst of thinking about the needs and the hurt of this world, we must remember that it is also a bent and broken world, that evil is a real thing, and that as followers of Jesus Christ, you are necessarily pointed upstream, and everything around you will be counter to what you believe to be true and the things that you believe in. We know that because Jesus said it would be so. So what will it take for you now to fulfill your calling to follow and serve Christ in this world? Well, it will take much more than I can address in the time we have here today, but I do want to take a couple of thoughts and share them with you, particularly from the lesson that was read earlier in the Gospel of Mark that E.J. read for us. And I'd like to use that lesson from the Gospel of Mark to illustrate a few points. In that passage in Mark 12, one of my favorites, is the story of the widow's might. I remember a very long time ago being shuttled off to vacation Bible school and the story of the woman's might and the flannel graphs, for those in the room that remember flannel graphs. Amen? Really? <laughs> uh, amen. <laughs> the flannel graphs and the widow's might. It's interesting that the passage that outlines the story of Jesus' instruction regarding the widow and her contribution in the temple court follows after Jesus' warning about the scribes, a warning to be careful of those who walk around in long robes <laughs> and sit in seats of honor, front row, nice. In the context of that warning, though, is a very powerful lesson. Jesus sits down and begins to watch people, people made in his image and likeness. The intimacy of that moment of Jesus sitting down and watching, and watching people come into the courts, rich people, leaving large sums of money in those chests, sometimes called shofar chests, the trumpet-like opening, where they would drop their contributions, large sums of money, heavy coins that make loud noises and call attention to the giver. In the court of women, Jesus is sitting watching these made in his image and likeness call attention to themselves in their giving. They are loud and proud and they give largely. And then Jesus sees the widow and she appears. She is poor, the Bible tells us. And she comes with two small coins. The word used to describe those coins that equals the value of about a penny is a word that comes from the root of the word thin. They're so light that if you held them in your hand and blew on them, you could blow them out of your hand with little effort. It's not just a meager contribution. It's the lowest of valued contributions in the minds of the world. And Jesus watches this woman cross through the crowds and drop those two lightweight copper coins into that chest. It made no noise. It was probably the subject of conversation that one who is of the lowest state, a woman without a man to take care of her, a woman who is poor, a woman who has nothing, a woman who must walk before the wealthiest of the day to leave in the service to the Lord her contribution, a meager two lightweight copper coins. Jesus seizes the moment to teach his disciples, calls them to himself and says to him, to them, truly, truly. He calls attention to the widow's actions and extols not just her generosity, but her faith and her character. The contrast between the two is striking. The rich come to call attention to themselves. They drop the large coins. They make loud noises. They are loud and proud and large. She comes poor and meager and drops her two coins. It's significant that there are two coins and she gives them both. She did not hold one in reserve. She gives all. The Lord calls attention to that and says, not only did she give all, she gave all she had to live on. I look at this story and ask myself, why would the Lord Jesus choose not just this moment with the, women, the woman in the court to call the disciples' attention to it, but why now in the course of his life and ministry? It's very near the end. He's about to predict the destruction of the temple, face his arrest and trial, his crucifixion. This close to the end of his time with his disciples, Jesus wants to call attention to something significant. There's something for them to learn, and he takes the opportunity to teach them. 
And my observations about this lesson are profound for you as you think about what's next for you beyond the walls of Cairn University. This is not, in my mind's eye, a quiet, poor woman at the lowest rung of society who makes a generous contribution. This is a woman of epic courage and conviction. She has a courage and conviction that is wrapped up in her faith. She is a poor widow in a place where she is extremely out of place. The visuals of the moment, in tattered rags, poor and destitute, one of those of whom Jesus warned, destroy the house of widows. She is poor. The visual of her crossing the courtyard to give her offering must have been profound, and the sound and lack of it as well. But it's the substance of her offering that Jesus calls attention to. For you and I to fulfill our calling, we must do more than simply exist, more than simply survive, more than simply call attention to our gifts and abilities. We must expend our time, talents, and our very lives in service to the Lord Jesus. We must give it all and hold nothing in reserve. The Lord is teaching his disciples at this critical moment something they will need because except for one, they will all face in the midst of great joy in serving Jesus in the time after his resurrection. They will all face martyrdom. The message for them is to hold nothing in reserve, to have the courage of your faith and the conviction in what you believe that you will act regardless of the context in which you find yourself. No matter how poor and meager you are, no matter what your level of ability and interest, no matter what your status or station, give it all. Because to follow the Lord Jesus, we must do more than simply exist, more than simply keep our head down and survive. We must expend everything we have and everything we are in his service. Like the Apostle Paul, who was poured out like a drink offering, you graduate now to go and be poured out in the service of the Lord Jesus. And for some of you, that will be in the trades, and some of you in raising your families, and some of you in obscurity and quietly using your hands, and others of you in leadership positions. I don't know what's in store for you. I'm often astonished where our graduates end up. But what we hold in common as graduates of this institution and followers of Jesus Christ is wherever he places us, we leave it all. What is required of us is courage that is not merely being fearless, it's being tenacious. And for us, that tenacity and courage is rooted in our faith, not in our own self-confidence. Life and work is not easy. Amen. Amen. Some of you think these four years have been, or six or seven, whatever it took you, some of you will think <laughs> these have been the most difficult of your life. No. Some of you will think they've been the easiest. <laughs> no. Some of you are concerned that these will be the happiest. The beautiful thing about following the Lord is each day is new, and His mercies are new every morning. We do not look back, we look forward. That kind of tenacious living comes from being rooted in your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Life and work is not easy. It is not meant to be. God only requires that we trust him, that we find courage in our faith to live and to believe in him. So stay in the word. Stay in Christian community and stay active. Do not hide. Do not look to simply hold on and ride it out. Leave it all on the battlefield. And do so with conviction. In our day, that will require much of you. You need great courage that comes from great faith. And you need conviction. You need to know what you believe. And believe what you believe. And live like it matters. Conviction is not outdated. It is not irrelevant. And it is not inherently divisive but you will go out into a world that tells you all of those things are true of conviction. But for the Christian, we must say no, because conviction is the certainty of what is hoped for. We are the followers of Jesus Christ, and it's conviction that gets us through. It is not conviction that gets us into trouble in this world. It's the lack of conviction. It's the lack of 
conviction and the lack of a commitment to live according to those convictions. How we live out our Christian faith and our convictions is critical. We must be gracious and compassionate. We need to participate and contribute to an increased level of civility and decency in the world in which we find ourselves. But grace and compassion and civility and decency do not require compromise of our core convictions. You must be clear, graduates, because the world into which you enter is more complicated than the world of any class that has preceded you. And it's only going to get harder as time goes on. How will you navigate a socially and culturally complex environment to hold firm your convictions in the teaching of God's word and the gospel of Jesus Christ, to not be preoccupied with acceptance by the world, but show them love and grace and compassion, you must be intentional. There is no doing that by accident. So know what you believe and why, and keep at it. Hold, hold to the core things of our faith. And follow the example of the widow in that courtyard and give it all. Hold nothing in reserve. Give everything you have. Be like that poor widow, a person of courage and conviction, wrapped in her faith. Do so now on this side of the resurrection of our Lord with your eyes fixed upon Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith. Because the writer of the book of Hebrews tells us where to do that. And he tells us that the righteous one lives by faith. And the one who lives by faith does not shrink back. My prayer is that the graduates of this institution would be among the boldest Christians we know. The ones with the clearest convictions. Exercised with the greatest degree of grace and compassion and strength. This is what the Lord calls us to. This is what it means to walk worthy of the calling with which you've been called. It's what we've trained you to do, and it's what we ask God to do in your life when you go forth from this place. There's a prayer in a prayer book that Dr. Taves and I found at the Clay Bookstore maybe 20 years ago. Eternal God, light of the minds that know thee, joy of the hearts that love thee, strength of the wills that serve thee, grant us so to know thee that we may truly love thee, and so to love thee that we may fully serve thee. Give all. You have nothing to lose and everything to gain. God bless.